She's good at what she does, isn't she? You know, they tell us to do home visits as pastors, right? I made a big mistake. I went to Melissa's house. It was a bad mistake. So, Joe, because he knows how to get someone to do healthy stuff, he, he got to my pride. And he was like, yeah, I drink this whole thing of like ginger, like squeezed ginger or something like that, and it's good for you. You won't be sore the next day, and da-da-da-da-da. I'm like, oh, not that bad. All right, I'll just do it at the end. So his wife starts like cutting, no, Joe starts cutting the ginger and then putting in the juicer. And I thought it was going to be like two sticks of ginger. You know, I've, I've never bought in ginger in my life, okay? Just tells you the type of person that I am. I go to Walmart, I look at the ginger, I'm like, what is that for, all right? And um, he puts one in and I'm like, oh, that's going to be it. And then he puts another. And then he puts another, and I kid you not, this guy juices like, like imagine like a, a bowl this big, and like that filled with just ginger. And then he pours it in a cup, no, he doesn't do this, he's like, pour how much you want, and I'll drink the rest. And you know, I'm like, what you think, I'm weak? You know, like, <laughs> like you testing my pride here? It has nothing to do with the sermon, just thought that'd be a funny story. And so I start pouring, and like, I could see his kids going like, like, are you sure? Like, what you think? I'm a man, you know? I keep going. And, and I keep pouring, and I'm like, and I can feel the, like, the, like, the, oh, I don't know what it was. It was in the air, just like, oh my goodness, is he going to do it? You know? And so I, I take the cup, and they're all looking at me. So I'm like, it's just ginger. How bad can it be? I chug it. <laughs> like, and I, just all of it all at once. And my mouth starts burning. Like, I've never felt pain in my life before. I'm like at the corner of their house about to like throw up. Like, I'm, I'm struggling. And Joe's over there like, yeah, it's good for you. Keep drinking it. <laughs> I don't think I ever want to visit any of you again, okay? <laughs> but uh, the point of that was absolutely no point. It's just, I had a wonderful time with you guys. Melissa's like, videotaping the whole thing. <laughs> uh, so, I hope we can spend time with each other December 16th. We're gonna, Steve came to me, Pastor, let's do a bowling night. So I was, you know how Steve is, shakes my hand, let's do a bowling night. So, I talked with our youth, young adult youth director back there, say hi Zach. Hi, Zach. Hi, Zach. Uh, we came up with an idea, we're gonna do bowling December 16th at 7 o'clock. We're going to rent the bowling alleys completely free for you guys. We just want to hang out with you before the year ends. Our last social event. We're not asking for money. We're not asking for anything. Asking for your presence. And if you want to participate, it's completely voluntary. We're doing a secret Santa. And so, if that is your desire, today, after church, you're going to have to sign up with me on my phone. Put your name down. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to mix it all up and give you an individual. I'll text you later. You have to get a gift for them, fifteen to twenty dollars, and then we're going to give it at the bowling night. Does that make sense? Any questions? Yes. Where's it at? It's going to be at bowling. Uh, what is that one by on Zaragoza? No, bowling El Paso. It's on Pelicano. Pelicano. I'll post it on Facebook for those of you on Facebook. I'll text you. And um, the Bowling El Paso right off of Pelicano, it's on the east side, it's the best rate. That's where we went last time when I first came, you remember? It was actually around this time of year that we did it too. So, I hope you can't miss it, and there was one more announcement. Was that it? That was it, right? Yeah. Alright then, stand to your feet. Um, stand to your feet, and go find someone and tell them happy Sabbath. There's Donna back there, we got a family, the Martinez is here, go find them and tell them happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath Day. Oh yeah, I have the Mevo. Oh my goodness. 
I want to get close to you guys. Me, John chapter 14. Today, you are going to leave late. I'm sorry. I have a lot to share with you. I have a lot to share with you. It's been a long time. John chapter 14, you got to say amen. If not, say wait for me. Jim, you got it? It's always good to see you, Jim. I need to see you Tuesday nights though. Saturday's not enough. I need to see you more often. I'm going to make you a member of this church whether you want to or not, alright? John chapter 14. You got it? Alright. Verse 1. Verse 1. God, just, just, just imagine Jesus is before you and he's reading this to you. And he's saying this to you. Just, just take a moment. Take a breath. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, and if it were not so, if, it, if that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. That's what Emmanuel means. That you may also be where I am. You know the place. You know the way to the place where I am going. And then Thomas, I love Thomas. He says, Lord, we do not know where you are going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the what? And no one can come to the Father except through who? If you really know me, you know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him. And you have what? Father. Lord, show us your glory. Amen. Father, we ask for you to reintroduce yourself to us. Father, we ask for a fresh blessing. The rains just fall down on our hearts, our troubled hearts, Lord, and all the things we're dealing with. But Father, may we lay them down this Sabbath and stop worrying. Father, because that's what Sabbath means. It means to stop. It means to pause, to breathe. In. And Father, with our breath, may we praise the Lord because you are good. Mm -hmm. So Father, we ask today that your Holy Spirit descend into our hearts and into our minds. Uh, Father, abide with us as we desire to abide with you. This is my prayer in the name of Jesus. Everybody says. Amen. See, you guys can have a seat. The Northeast has messed me up. <laughs> I thought this was my idea. I am a pastor's kid, for those of you who don't know. I have seen some messed up stuff in church. What people do in the name of religion is worse than what people do without God in the midst. It is crazy. And I have seen some jacked up stuff. I have seen elders, not like your elders. Chaplain Molina and Miss Knight are absolutely beautiful and wonderful. You're handsome, not beautiful, okay? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah, I got it. But uh, I was, you know, I was told to make sure that there's this big wall. And, and of course, there needs to be a distinction. Um, you know, I believe that. There needs to be a clear distinction of what my calling is and what my job is. That I have no problem calling you out at any time because that is my job if need be. But I also have no problem loving you to the very end because that's what my job needs to be. But there was an idea in my mind that I needed to build a wall to make sure you knew pastor, member, leader, follower. And I guess it was birthed out of my arrogance and pride. Um, and just my experience, my background, my culture, just the way I was brought up. Then I, I started to interact with this church called the Northeast. <laughs> And y'all mess me up, man. Oh, man. I came. I, I, uh, I came and I was starting to, the first few weeks were very difficult. I didn't know anybody. It was by myself. Um, it was just lonely. I had no idea what it called, what I was supposed to do. Then I came to preach. Then the prayer meetings, the prayer meetings are just phenomenal. If you're not going, then honestly, just shame on you. But anyway, <laughs> um, and I, uh, I, prayer meetings were just powerful, something I've never experienced before. And then, uh, and then I started doing home visits. 
I wasn't drinking ginger yet. <laughs> I was just doing home visits, and then I, uh, I visited this one guy named Ken. Have you heard of him? Ken and Rosemary. And they would always try to get me to sleep over. Just, it would bother me, you know? I was like, no, member, pastor, don't sleep at your house, you know? It's like, that's the number one thing you just don't do because then they get too friendly with you, right? That's what members have. They get too friendly, you know? They talk to you for an hour just about how you were almost bit by a dog, right? They get too friendly, you know? But Rosemary and Ken, man, every single time, pastor, it's late. We have a guest room. I'm like, guys, no, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go to my house. Always felt uncomfortable because if I sleep at your house, man, oh man, do I really love you. And all of you are like, he's never slept in my house. Well, just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. But uh, I, uh, it, time and time again, and Ken was persistent. If not one thing, he was very persistent. Pastor, sleep, it's late. And I would stay at their house for like 12, 1, playing card games and just talk, listening to Ken talking about his, you know, his time in Vietnam or just Rosemary, like, can't stop, can't stop. <laughs> and uh, finally he got me. It was late. It was so late. And I was exhausted. And I was like, you know what? I had nowhere to go. I was like, I don't have a change of clothes. Pastor, don't worry. We're okay. You can smell. We have a shower. You're fine. <laughs> I was like, oh, and I fought it and I fought it. And then I finally gave in to the request. And Rosemary's like, stop asking him, but Pastor, and then Ken was like, no, I almost got him. And he got me. <laughs> he got me. I slept at his house. I wake up the next morning to the smell, I'm sorry, to the smell of, I, I mean not to offend anyone, but the smell of fresh turkey bacon. It was beautiful. <laughs> and eggs sizzling. And there was Rosemary cooking. <laughs> and Ken just sitting there, just waiting for me to get up. <laughs> How was it, Pastor? Did you like the sunrise? You know, I'm just, I'm just like overwhelmed with this hospitality. And you know what began to happen? My perspective of how to minister began to change. Amen. Because of, because of a, a love that I've never experienced before. And, and that's why I hurt so much that day when he passed. He was my friend. And it's been like a year, but it hurt a lot. And I remember the call, and, and I remember going to the hospital, and I remember the drive back after dropping off the car. And uh, I remember getting in my bed, and uh, and I finally was able to just break. You know, I felt like I felt like I was just like you know pastor mode the whole day, and then finally it was just like I was by myself. My wife was in Phoenix. I was just by myself. I didn't have a dog at this time. That might have been helpful. And then uh, I'm just crying, angry, crying, mad, crying, upset, crying, sad, shocked. All these emotions raging in me. I've never experienced anything like this. And I could feel God's presence. And since I could feel his presence, I had someone to be angry at. Oh, you don't understand it, but oh, that's a sermon for a different day. And I remember I'm, I'm having a conversation with God in my tears. I cannot explain it to you what that is like and how to get to that place. You just have to do it. And me and God are, are talking. I'm yelling, and He is a father. Listen. And I'm, I'm sad. God, why? You know that question, how could you let something like this happen? We're going to get to that question. Don't forget it. I told you, today you're stuck with me. And we're talking and I'm yelling and I'm sad and I'm angry and all these different things. And, 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 and the whole time, in my mind, I'm putting God in such a high, exalted place that he cannot bear to understand my pain. Because when God is disconnected, when he's distant, I feel like since he can't understand, I can be angry at him. But if he can understand my pain, I can't really be angry at him, can I? But I feel like he can empathize with me. But since he can't empathize with me because of the way I'm portraying it, because of my preconceived ideas of what, where God is and what he's doing and how he is. And so God is, God is like, Elia, look at my heart. And I'm yelling back, Father, I don't want to look because I know what I'll find if I look into his heart. And he keeps yelling back, 
Again, I cannot explain to you, but this is just how sometimes prayer works. And, and he yelling back, Elliot, look at my heart. And I'm like, God, I don't want to look at my, I don't want to look at your heart. I want to be angry. I want to be like in an island by myself and I can blame anyone I want to. I don't want to be understood. Elliot, look at my heart. And then he roars like a lion. And I finally take a peek. And I hear a clear, audible voice. Clear as day. And it says, Eliab, I miss him too. It changed my perspective of who God is. That day. Completely. It threw me for a loop. Because <laughs> God missed Ken. Just like I missed him. And he probably missed him even more. Because you can't talk to Ken. And I can't talk to Ken. But guess who can't also talk to Ken? Because guess what? Good at Texas. Look at you. I'm so proud. <laughs> but it, it was changing my perspective on God because God is not distant. God is not afar off. God is not just watching your life like a Netflix series like, oh, next episode. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> no, he's there. He's in the midst of it. He's with you. He's hurting with you. He doesn't have to. That's the thing. But he's with you. And that was changing my perspective on who God is and what he is like and his character and all the different things. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. To allow God to reintroduce himself to you. Because as we grow up, like I said before, we come up with these preconceived ideas of who God is like, what he does, what his purpose is, what his plans are, all these different things. And these things are based on multiple things. Ask any psychologist or someone who studies psychology. There's environmental, there's bi biological stuff that can deal with you. There's even culture, there's your family. I mean, when you say father, heavenly father, what is the first thought that pops into your mind when you say father? You think about your earthly what? father so if your earthly father was present you're going to take that and apply that to your heavenly father but what if he was absent what if he was an amazing dad but what if he was abusive and the same thing with your mother believe it or not jesus describes himself like a hen and wanting to gather his chicks because when you take both genders put it together guess what you see you see god yeah. and so what if your mother as well was presence or maybe she was absent or maybe she was abusive or maybe she was wonderful but we take all these different things and we apply it to who god is and there are things that i'm sure god is like good that is exactly who i am but then there's other ideas that we have of god that god's like what are you even thinking that has nothing to do with who i am and yet we go on believing these things about god why because sometimes it's I guess more comfortable to just have things set in stone rather than to live in the uncertainty. And so, let me get my notes out. I'm like going off and I don't even know where I'm at. And so there is a, my first Sabbath here, I remember, I remember that uh, we were sitting right here. This was when we had the tables and everything like that. How things have changed. Oh my goodness. <laughs> And uh, Van stands up and he walks up to Miss Knight and he's like, and I'm like, what is this guy walking up on the stage for? Like, this is weird. Like, what kind of church is this, right? And then I figure out, oh, there's an active shooter. This is my first Sabbath as a pastor. It was crazy. You remember? Crazy. We ended, yeah, you remember. That was my first Sabbath. First time ever preaching. Yeah, flashback real. Yeah, there you go. And, I, and we had to end, we had to end uh, uh, the fellowship lunch early. We were having a good time. You know, Anna, she used to come. I hope she hears this one day. She used to come. And, you know, she's just talking for days with everybody. And we're having a wonderful time. We have to cut it short because we didn't know if there was multiple shooters all around El Paso. And so everyone goes home. I'm like, I'm like, what kind of sick is this? You know, I'm, I'm, like, I'm like, what did God put me on? You know, and I leave that day, come back the next week. There's that memorial. How many of y'all went to the memorial? Did any of you guys go? Oh, yeah, I went multiple times. It was sobering. You go, you missed it, Pastor. You wasn't here. But there was 20, was it 22 crosses? I think it was 22. And there was a tiny baby cross. That's what messed me up. And I remember looking at the crosses and just, just blown away by the 
the darkness that just happened that day. And um, I, I would go and I would see people crying and just people mourning. And, but I would also hear a question. God, how could you let this happen? You've heard that question before? How could you let this happen? A few weeks later, I was going to go watch a movie by myself, sad on me, I was engaged all by myself, didn't have any friends. So I went to go watch a movie by myself. But the Holy Spirit was talking to me, and I was, I was kind of with him in the parking lot, just in his presence. And, and I felt him moving through my thoughts, like, hey, go visit, the, you know, go visit the, the memorial again. So, you know, the movie theater right across where they used to have it. So I walk over, and I'm, I'm walking through the crosses, and I said, man, man, it just felt... You felt different. You walked, once you walked into that place, it was just a different, um, we use the word vibe. I know some of you old people don't know, but that's the word, <laughs> vibe. And, uh, and, I, and I, I would see people, but then I looked at the last cross and there was this man frantically cleaning, like a crazy person just cleaning. And there was a bunch of leaves and dust and all these trash building up by this cross, a bunch of flowers, and he was just going in and my heart was moved with compassion so i walk up to him and i'm like hey brother can i help you can i help you and he's like yeah, yeah come here come here and he, 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 just, he just he doesn't even care he doesn't even take a, a second to look at me so he just tells me to pick this sign up and we pick it up and we move it and later i know his name was tony and uh he's the brother that ha hosted the biggest funeral i think it was like a world record or something like that his wife was shot that day and he was alone, no other family, and this man took his wife from him. And we began talking, and my heart was breaking. You know, I've been trying to deal with this through alcohol, and I've been pulled over, da 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 da. And like the cops have been very gracious to me, but I just don't know how to handle this. And he's talking, he's just laying it all out, just just the just the uncertain, just just the awfulness of what this world can bring. And and then he says. Because I, I, he asked me, what do I do for a living? And I was like, eventually I said, oh, I'm, I'm a pastor. And then he brings up this side of the conversation, which was like, one of my Christian friends said that this was a part of God's plan. Have you heard that before? Right. Oh, that bothers me so much. God wanted this to happen. And so one of his Christian friends tried to say that in order to comfort him and try to bring peace in a situation that, that truly there is no peace. And I, I had been listening, I had been trying to practice my listening skills, but when he said that, I could not stay quiet any longer. I just couldn't. That bothered me to my core that someone would believe that God planned this. Because when you think about it, I started thinking about the question. Um, the question is, don't worry, we're going to get to the Bible. I'm almost there. I'm, I'm creating the tension in the problem, and then we're going to get to the solution. That's how you do homiletics. But the, the idea when you look at the question, how could God let this happen, right? I began to think about it, and the way you come to this question is by having this foundation or this basis of what you think God is like. And there's two sides of the spectrum, two, two extreme sides of the spectrum. One side of the spectrum that can come to this type of question, how God can you let this happen, believes this about God, that God predetermines everything. Follow this train of thought. I'm talking about predetermines the good, the bad, the ugly, right? That old movie that my dad made me watch. Oh, man, it's so long. Anyways. But God predetermines everything. It doesn't matter what it is. God has predestination, da 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 da. They get this, this quote from what, Romans or something like that, Calvinism, whatever. But this doesn't sit well with us, especially those who, who begin to think a little bit beyond the surface. Because when you start to ponder and think, God, you predestined everything, the good and the bad, how could you want this to happen to me? How could this be good that you wanted me to go through X, Y, or Z? Father, you, you say you're a good God. You say you're a God of love. Yet you preordained me to suffer in this way in order for what? So that's one side of the spectrum that God preordains everything. But then the other side of the spectrum that can also come to the conclusion or even the thought process of God, how could you let this happen, is the uh, other side, which is, the type of God that pretty much created Adam, took a step back, got his popcorn, I don't know if you like kennel corn or regular, got some salt, got a little drinks here, and he just started flipping the switch like he did with Netflix, doing absolutely nothing. Just watching, entertained by the chaos, right? 
And when he could step in, nah, I'm good. That's their problem. I'm indifferent. I'm so high and exalted that I do not have time to bother or even intervene. But this doesn't sit well with us either. Why? Because God, you say you're a God of love. Once again, you say you're compassionate, merciful, just, and all these great things. Wonderful counselor. Yet how can you stand back and just watch as we suffer here? And so I looked at Tony in the face. I was like, Tony, can I tell you something? And he's like, what? God did not want your wife to die. And he was like, confused that a pastor would say something. Like, and that's what bothers me. My goodness. They're confused about what Christians would say. What should say. But anyway. I say, Tony, God never wanted your wife to suffer like this. And he would never want you to ever go through this. This was not God's plan. This was not God's intention. This was not even God's doing. And he looked at me with a face of just confusion, right? And the reason why, I, I told you I'm going to get a little bit deep with y'all, but we understand this. And I'm going to explain this to you because you're stuck. But you can always leave, but you're stuck. But we understand that God is a God of what? John chapter 4, chapter, verse 4, verse 9 is what? God is what? Love. Thank you so much. And since he is love, he needs to give what? Starts with an F. R-E-E-D-O-M. He needs to give what? Freedom, thank you so much. And since he gives freedom, there's always R-I-S-K? Risk. Risk. We've talked about this before. You've heard Ty Gibson. You've done some Bible study. You know what I'm talking about. Since God is love, he cannot force, he cannot coerce. So he must give freedom if that's who he is. But if he gives freedom, he will always want to live in a place of risk. Because you always have the opportunity to say what? No. And that is a good God. And we cry for independence, but then when God finally gives us our independence, we whine about it. It makes no sense. And so, obviously, what has happened in this world is that God is maneuvering through it. Maneuvering through the junk that we have made. But I didn't have time to tell him all this, but this was just kind of extra. But I just simply told him this was, God, this was not God's intention. And he just looked at me. But I knew the Holy Spirit planted a seed. But that look of confusion as I was pondering this week of what to share with you. That look of confusion came about because his perspective on who God was and is was changing. And I thought about the ninth of the, fest of the Passover. Go with John chapter 14 for me if you can. I thought about that night. John chapter 14. No, it's 13, sorry. John chapter 13. That look of confusion. Because my perspective of who God is is changing. Also came about here in these disciples. We know the disciples. A bunch of lowly fishermen. Some a, a tax collector. One guy is just really rich and good with money. We call him Judas. He later on betrays Jesus. And um, they're just, you got you got a zealot. That means someone who's willing to kill Roman shoulders on behalf of God. Like killing on behalf of God is what God wants, right? It's so confused. And so they're, 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 he has a bunch of these different men and they're all trying to push their ideas and their preconceived ideas upon Jesus and telling Jesus who he should be. Right? They're telling God how he should act. They're telling God what he should do. And in their mind, they're thinking they're into Jerusalem. And in their mind, they're thinking that Jesus, you're going to go. You're going to go to the temple. You're going to take your throne. I'm almost there. You're going to take the throne. And, and Jesus, you're going to demolish these Romans. Wipe them out. This is what we know. and This is what we believe. And Jesus, you're about to do what we want. <clears throat> Follow with me. Mm -hmm. Telling God what he should do. That's kind of funny, isn't it? <laughs> But this is, this is the way they've come about it because throughout Jesus' ministry, make no mistake, he's given them opportunity after opportunity, teaching, lectures, time with him to show them who God is like. We just read it in John chapter 14. If you have seen me, you've seen who? God. The Father. And it should have blown their socks off. Right? 
but still they're stubborn, unwilling to let go of what they believe and finally submit to the unknown. That's good. That's Peter stepping off the boat. That's what that looks like. Not knowing if you're going to sink or stand, but yet you still take the step. But it's the last night that Peter will ever have a night like this with him. Well, that Jesus will ever have a night with him. And Jesus, he has to do one more thing. One more thing. And I love this story. If you look at just the first few verses. This blows me away. It was just before the Passover, verse 1, chapter 13. Jesus knew that an hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. This is like John just saying the, the summary of everything. This is Jesus revealing his love, his glory, who he is. Man, I wish I had time to go to John chapter too, right, JJ? We could talk about Jesus drinking wine with a smile on his face. But different sermon for a different day. The evening meal was in progress. The devil, check this out, had already promoted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Did Jesus already know this? Yet he still invited him to come. Some of y'all think you're not ready to come to Jesus. <laughs> like, you're the one who needs to, like, uh, anyway. Anyway. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things, what? Under, in his hands. And that he had come from God and was returning to God. God is all powerful by himself. He don't need you. <laughs> Truly, he doesn't need you. We sometimes think that we need to give something to God in order to complete him. But in reality, God was already complete by himself. That's why we say the Trinity. Amen. And that should give you some sort of peace to know that there's nothing you can give nor nothing you can take that can subtract from what God and who God is. But it's just beautiful to know that God just still wants you to just come. But this is, imagine with me, where God is standing right now. Yes, he, can, he knows the cross is coming, but he has such faith in, in his Father that even though he can't see past the cross, he knows that whatever the Father's will, it will come to pass because it says his word will not come back to him void. And so that means Jesus understands that everything that I'm doing, it is for the good of my Father and God is going to have his way. I am going to be restored. I'm going to be redeemed. I'm going to be made. I, Jesus is going to sit on a throne right across, right next to his Father. Jesus knows all of this. And he's going to redeem the world. I said he's going to be redeemed. I mean he's going to redeem you. That's what I meant. Mm -hmm. and, and yet, knowing all this power and strength, you read in the next verse, and I could just imagine John just like riding in with that quill. He's just laughing. And he says, so he got up from the meal. And I have to share this. When you share a meal with someone in the Jewish culture, you're saying we're equal. In the Jewish culture, a meal was not just like, hey, come over. It wasn't like entertainment. This was hospitality we're talking about. You and I are equal. You're sitting at my table. That means I love you and I respect you as a person. Jesus is sitting at a table with a bunch of fishermen arguing about who's going to be the greatest. And then he gets up from the table. Took off his outer clothing. Wrapped a towel around his waist. And he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples. What? And I'm not talking about the way you wash each other's feet on communion, right? Where you just get water and you're like... <laughs> and you get the towel. What can I pray for you? Amen. Have a good one. And then you go to the hand sanitizer, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not that way. <laughs> I know. Some of your feet stink, but it's okay. It's not okay. <laughs> this is the one where he got... It just imagine. They call him rabbi for a reason. Because they have respect for him. Some of them even dare to call him the son of God. Funny thing enough, all the people that call him the son of God are not even Jewish people. Anyway, the rabbi kneels, looks this guy dead in the face. And I can just imagine, it's with a smile on his face. Could he could see the uncomfortability of that disciple? 
Yeah, you just imagine that. Just I love Donna. She's back. Amen. Amen. She's back. I heard the laugh and I was waiting for it. And and it was just a smile just going through the toes and washing his feet clean. And the disciple just eyes locked onto Jesus in complete shock. What kind of God is this? His ideas of who God is are beginning to change. And then he goes to the next disciple. And the other disciple, as he's putting on his sandals, he's still so disturbed. <laughs> you know, because in his mind, in his culture, if you are the greatest, people serve you. And so he goes to the next disciple, does the very same thing. No one has the courage to speak. But then you got this dumb guy called Peter. <laughs> and I, I feel like I would be Peter. And Peter goes, Jesus, you're going to wash my feet really begin to meditate on this on this on this on this just this, this portion i think number one john wanted to really call out peter number one i think they were kind of petty like that i just want to hope and believe they were like that because it just it makes them the enjoyment of reading the text better but also i think that john wants to say something to the reader and jesus responds unless i wash you you have no part with me and jesus says that because peter says you will what Never wash my what? And I began to meditate. I was sitting on my desk and I was just, Father, this is disturbing me. And I, I was just thinking. And by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, as he's working through my thoughts, I began to realize, Jesus, you are God. And the way I think God should act is he should never be washing anybody's feet. My perspective of who God is, is a God that should be high and exalted, and we should be serving him. Don't worry, we're going to get to a story about more prostitutes in just a second. Oh, that's going to be good. But in, 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 in Peter's mind, he already has an idea of who God should be, and how he should be served, and what we should do in order to receive the good grace of our Father in heaven. And so that's why he says, Jesus, you're not matching my, my ideas and my perspectives on who you should be, you ain't going to do it. You're going to do what I want you to do. Oh, this is so good. And then Jesus says, what? Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And Jesus says, how long is it going to take for you to stop telling me how I should be and start submitting to who I am? How long is it going to take you to stop pushing on a door that obviously says pool? Have you ever done that? It's so embarrassing. <laughs> it is the worst. You kind of look around just hoping no one just saw that and then you just then you step in. That's how we deal with God. Jesus, I am not what you want me to be. I am that I am. So we think that Mercy. You know, in their mind, God is the God with the crown of glory on his head, a scepter in his hand, the purple robe on his back, and he's ruling the universe. But little do they know, soon they will, that he's also the same God that took off the crown of glory to receive a new crown, the crown of thorns. And he took off that purple robe so that we can whip him so he could barely stand. Put a new robe on him so that we could just rip him off to inflict more pain. And that, that scepter that was in his hand, he took, he let it go. That's what he did. It's not that it was taken from him. He let it go. So that in its place you could put a, a nail right through him. And so he finishes washing Peter's feet. And he says, in verse 11, Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord. And rightly so. Don't get mistaken. He is God. For that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another. And notice how our perspective on who God is should affect the person we become. Amen. And so that's why it's important that today you leave behind your preconceived ideas. Amen. 
That's why it's important that when you come to the altar, whether it is in your closet, whether it is in your bed or in your shower, that you finally let go and come to the end of yourself, step off the boat and finally step onto the waters of uncertainty so that God can actually speak to you and finally tell you, this is who I am. And let me tell you something, when you discover that, you will become who you were supposed to be. In, Jesus, in Paul's day, the story of prostitutes, you can go, my friend. There was a temple. God always heard this, but you kind of heard this. Unless she's asleep, she's asleep. It's okay. The best place to sleep is in church. We're good. Don't wake her up. It's good. But the, there was a temple that was dedicated to the god of sex. I forgot her name. I think Aphrodite. Am I correct? Aphrodite. And this was in Jesus' day as much as this was in Paul's day. And Paul's writing this about pornea. That's the word for uh, sexual immorality. Different sermon for a different day. We can talk about sex. We will talk about sex eventually, but not today. And, and in Paul's day, he's, he's, he's like painting the picture that how are you going to become one with the prostitute? Don't you understand that? And he's painting the picture of what sex is and what it does. Da, 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 da. And I begin to meditate and think about it. Because... Because those prostitutes thought in order to please God, or the God of Aphrodite, they must give their bodies over to people and allow them to have their way with them. Regardless if it hurt them, regardless if it was uncomfortable, regardless if it wasn't even something they didn't want to do. But they would offer themselves so, allowing other, so that the other people can inflict certain things upon them that they were never supposed to experience. And it's, and it's just crazy to me how, how, in what, how, how these individuals have come to this understanding that this is the way they need to interact with gods, right? Undercase. Lowercase, undercase, lowercase. And so these people would offer themselves up from little children all the way to grown adults, giving themselves, and people could come, purchase, spend a little bit of money, do whatever they want to do, and just throw you back into the temple as if you were just some piece of meat. But people would think this is acceptable. This is how we believe God is supposed to be like. Are you following this? But, can I tell you about your God? Because your God, the funny thing is he goes to the temple. That's the crazy part. First off, I don't want you to forget he goes to the temple. Because there's other people that would not even step near the temple. Why? Because it is dirty and nasty and just absolutely disgusting. And that is what we are. But Jesus, he goes to the temple. And he has some money. Make no mistake. He got a lot of money. Son of glory. And he purchases you. And you think this is just another go around. Here we go. Let me get ready. But then he takes you by the hand. And it's different this time. He's talking to you like a human being. Not like just something. <clears throat> and he's leading you. And you're not walking to a house, which is typically where you go, or to a back alley, or just some random dark location. No, he's taking you somewhere that you've never been before. He's taking you to a synagogue. Why, God's name is he taking you there? I don't deserve to go there. And then he finally takes you, and he takes you up to the altar, and there is the Father and the Holy Spirit as witnesses. And they stand there with a smile on their face. And then the Father asks Jesus, Will you take this lawfully wedded husband or wife to be your husband or wife? And Jesus looks you in the eye and he says, I do. But then the crazy part about all this is that the father looks back at you and he asks the same question. And you have the opportunity to say yes or no. And if you say yes, Jesus marries you. Oh, it's so beautiful. He takes you by hand. He puts a ring on your finger. He puts a new robe over your body. He covers you like he did in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were ashamed and naked. And, and then he says, come and walk with me for the rest of your day. Be with me. Be my wife or be my husband. Just be with me. And I will love you. I will never take you back to that temple. But I'm going to stay with you. Emmanuel says for all eternity. And that is the type of God we serve. Amen. 
the type of God that is not afraid to deal with your junk and your baggage, the type of God that is, that is so beautiful and so loving that He is willing to purchase something that is not valuable, but in His eyes, it's, it's more than that. And I just want to ask you this Sabbath, that maybe, could it be, that there are some ideas that you have of God that actually God would disprove of? Could it be that you have focused so much on prophecy that you've lost sight of Jesus? Could it be that there are some concepts and ideas that you are so hell-bent on, but yet you lose sight of Jesus like hanging on the cross? Could it be that maybe today you need to let go and let God have his way with you? Amen. That's my invitation for you. Truly, I ask you this week, spend time with Jesus every morning. Don't pray. Don't speak. Don't have music on. Don't even have your Bible. But just sit and listen. Ten minutes every morning, that's my challenge for you. To just sit and contemplate a prayer. And allow God to speak to you and bring things up into your mind. And, and I promise you, he will work through your thoughts like he's been working through our junk and sin. And he will bring things up to you. But when he does, you have one job. Step off the boat. Amen. Father in heaven, this Sabbath, we bring our bodies, our minds, just all of us to you. Have your way with us. Father, you, you bought us from a temple that used to harm us. And Father, there are so many times in our life where we go running back to that same temple. But I ask today, Father, that Father, you hold us tight into your arms so that we can remain with you and abide in your presence. And Father, as we do so, may we look at you like a child looks at a parent. Father, just, just helpless and, and, Father, desiring to learn. Father, full with humility. Father, may we desire to just know who you are because you said this is the eternal life that we may know you, Father, the one and true God. So, Lord, we ask for you to reintroduce yourself to us this today and for the rest of our lives. Amen. Be with us, Lord. We pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Everybody says. Amen. We're going to have a baptism. I'll be right back. Amen. We can sing a song. Let's turn in our hymnals to number 462. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. 